Hello, Mage fans. This is Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson. I'm joined by host Terry Robinson. And today on Tomes of Magic, we're bringing you something of a bonus episode. Uh, Terry and I talked about the books in Sorcerer's Crusade and Dark Ages Mage. And when that was done, we got some listener questions. And we thought, you know, it might be fun for Terry and I to give our answers to these questions and let the readers know what was on our minds while we were reading through these. So, Terry, would you agree we both have some opinions on these books? I would say lightly that you and I have an opinion on this. And when you said what was going through your mind while you were reading this, mine hands down was how are there so many damn mage books? But I don't think those were the kind of things that you were thinking about. Just as a note, we still will be covering Mage Victorian, but these two were big things. They were kind of in communication with each other. We will still talk about Victorian Mage, but that will be at a later date. Certainly. So we boiled it down to about eight questions from our listeners. We thought that uh, might be fun just to, to work through these one after another. First question we had was, what age or time period would you like to see added to mage? So Terry, what were your thoughts on that? The two I'm thinking of is, so sometimes you get a time period as a big expansive setting, and then other cases you get like a little guy. For the little guy, I want to see biblical mage. I want to see a game of mage where you are freedom fighters in the first city of Enoch trying to throw off the vampires. And then if you take the biblical continuity that a bunch of games imply, you're now all kind of in the Levant. And you're like, oh, what do we do now? And now you have magical effects such as invent gardening and construct a small house. And I think that would be neat for probably precisely one session. <laughs> I think that's what I could get out of that one. That's more of an exercise. That's more of a kind of a, a warm-up activity or a, or a thought exercise. The Storyteller Handbook made mention of, hey, this is how the spheres could work way back when, and it was just like a single sidebar column. The one I think I really would want to see is Mage of Enlightenment. This would be the pre-modern. This would be before the Victorians. The technocracy is adrift. They don't know what they're doing. The Caserify are gone. At this point, depending on when the area you set it, Chiron Mostai has already formed the Janissaries within the Hermetics. The traditions are suffering from crippling politics inside of Horizon. At this point, the Cult of Ecstasy and the Euthanatoi are just kind of assassin groups trying to kill the Order of Reason until Shazar comes back. There's the slow creeping realization among the Verbena and the Dream Speakers of, oh, we're boned. The Ottoman Empire is at its peak of power and it's just kind of like kicking ass out there. Like, what is that game where the Ali Batini web of faith is really the center of activity? China and India are still global powers before Europe has even had a chance to rise. I would like to see Mage kind of on the cusp of an industrial revolution. And that's kind of the era I would most like to see. I've also done kind of the, uh, a friend of the show, Chaz Kellner also mentioned, it would be interesting if the start of the Ascension War were tied to the Victorian era. So instead of it happening in 1466, it happens in the 1800s, and that makes for a much newer Ascension War. And those are kind of the alternate timelines, other eras I would like to see. What are your thoughts, Adam? Yeah, your take on the, uh, I guess, roughly the 1700s sounds awfully interesting to me. I can just see the Ali Batin saying, we want to share with everyone the web of faith. And, and you guys are backing the Ottomans. We have faith in superior firepower. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have faith in swords, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I really do like that. That that does sound fascinating. It was an interesting time in the established lore of, of the traditions and the conventions. But for my answer, I, I went in uh, a little bit of a different uh, direction. I would like to run games in Japan in the first half of the 1500s. I would enjoy Europe and North America in the 1700s. And this was before I heard Terry's answer on that. But when I think of periods that have both good sales potential and appeal for me, I see two. Uh, first, the 1920s and 1930s was a time of exploration and discovery, focusing on pulp elements and world travel. I see a cold war between the traditions and the technocracy as they send their members out in a scramble to acquire mystic treasures before a planetary alignment that is, I don't know, three years away. They don't want to lose resources in a direct conflict with the alignment so near. The result is diplomacy and trickery as they maneuver to gain secrets and talismans. Second, the second half of the first century soon after Rome became an empire. This is a time when paradigms and the consensus wasn't really understood by 
same mages in the setting. Each mage faction would have two or three spheres they couldn't learn. This makes counter magic more difficult and the arts of other factions mysterious. The empires and cultures of the time would be fascinating to explore. I would make uh, new factions that did not survive to later eras. I really like your idea of Roran Ascension. I think that would be interesting. You come up with either a contrivance that like, hey, during the Great War, the traditions and the technocracy did actually work together just enough to plant those seeds of a truce and people are feeling it out. Obviously, it doesn't work out, but you have this brief period of time where, as you mentioned, it's, oh, how do we scramble around the world and we secure these lost magics? And I also like the idea of there just being factions that we never get any information about again, especially if like there were actually an insetting justification for it. So like I'm done, both of the, if either of those appeared on the STV, it would just be like the fry gif of shut up and take my money. The next question, what new mechanic or idea did you most like from these two settings that you would like to see in M20? Several new mage factions did make it from Sorcerer's Crusade to Mage 20. Uh, the new way of handling Paradox in Sorcerer's Crusade is appealing, but I don't want to see it in Mage 20. The idea of pooling backgrounds in Dark Ages would be great in Mage 20. It just needs a little support. Dark Ages assumed the combining of backgrounds would be done at character generation. Page 336 of Mage 20 gives us experience point costs for raising backgrounds. Give a new cost for raising pooled backgrounds and let players split it. To echo one of Cherry's statements, a game where the players establish their own venture becomes, at least partially, a game about maintaining and growing their chantry, node, company, you know, etc. Uh, this kind of game could be a lot of fun. We need some mechanics or maybe even roll tables for potential good and bad things happening to the shared background. Does the rating change? Does the shared background gain a merit or flaw? Also, tell us how a chantry built in this manner compares to a standard chantry, which is rated 1 to 5. This opens up new possibilities for play. A 120-page supplement could nail this. Well, if they keep the in-character fiction to a minimum. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> Terry, what, uh, what are your thoughts on that? From Dark Ages Mage, the system I like is that quintessence is needed and useful. To create a permanent enchantment, you need to spend, what was it, one point of quintessence per five successes and to make something permanent you needed 10 times the normal number of successes and that made it real easy to make talismans and wonders and so on in a way that would make sense and also it would advance my subtle desire to get rid of prime as a sphere and just put literally anything else make it the sphere of cheesecake or something i don't care it would be more useful than prime in a lot of cases i like the fact that it makes it easy for a mage to have their tools be enchanted we got the idea in revised of minor wonders which only required prime 2 which i thought was kind of neat i like the idea that raising your foundation does something so the hermetic who reaches modus uh, when you got to five points in it you could spend two points of willpower in a turn and that was a active mechanical thing and i think either spheres or a rite should do the same thing it would kind of be like a souped up resonance system and i just like the fact that there was a mechanical benefit besides just having one more die in the die pool and i think that that was kind of neat from sorcerer's crusade I like the idea that the Ascension War looks very different in different places and the relationship between the factions is a little bit messier. Like the only one in the modern editions that took that anywhere was in Isle of the Mighty. We get the idea that the technocracy is more genial in the UK and you may be opposed to the traditions, but to some extent, game recognizes game. Like one of the ideas behind Vampire is, yes, you are solitary hunters, but to some extent, you still crave the company of people like you. And in certain areas, the difference between two technocrats, one from that area, one not from that area, is going to be much bigger than the difference between a technocrat and maybe a traditionalist in that area. So I think that's interesting. It makes it easier to make buddy cop stuff and team up stuff. And I just tend to like those games more. I also like the fact that the Maximi were named and identified. I think they're cool characters. I think it's neat to know who the head of the high artificers are or of the craft masons and the way they got to different places. I, I don't think you take anything away by saying this person's in charge by default for now, if you want them to be. I don't care. I'm not telling you what to do. 
in Modern Mage, we only get that for the 2E Prime Eye, and we only get that for some of the technocracy. Like, we know about Tychoides, we know about the Ivory Tower, we know about the SVPs, we know about the hyper-intelligent dolphins that run the progenitors, and that's about it. But yeah, that's what I kind of liked from those two. So, question number three, should Sorcerer's Crusade get a second edition? If so, when would it be set? I don't feel a strong draw to there being a update to second edition, like there being a needed sorcerer, uh, a second edition to Sorcerer's Crusade. I certainly wouldn't argue with it if it were to be produced because it's more, it's more mage words, but I, I don't think it is, it is necessary. I think the closest I would want would be, and this is kind of in later questions would be to kind of fill out some things. So if a new edition gave us that, I'd certainly be fine with that. I would want it to be at a time when the faith mysticism technology trichotomy is, is more balanced. And I don't know if there ever is a time when that actually happens where it's really up in the air because like, what is it listed as faith, magic, reason? And then as we go along, we're like, oh wait, the order of reason is also kind of a heavily faith inflected organization. Like we have the Gabrielites, we see it constantly in the paradigm books. So I don't know if we would need to change the location and maybe get more information about the Balkans, for instance. And that was a, listed as a place where, where mystic magic was still more potent and religion was kind of more up in the air. But I don't know when or where that actually happens. Like moving it into the East is interesting because just kind of the dichotomy between magic and reason is kind of a different beast from what I understand. But when I think of people that know literally anything about the past or areas outside of Europe, I think of Adam. Adam, what do you think about Sorcerer's Crusade getting a second edition? And if so, when would you set it? After reading the books, I, I thought it was just interesting how they started out saying our time period is, is uh, 1400 to 1550. And then about halfway through the books, they started saying, wow, there's all this fascinating stuff that happened from 1550 to roughly 1650. So I, I just think it's if there was any update to the books, I think it would just be natural to reset it. I would say 1450 to 1600. But I tend to agree with you. I, I don't think it really needs a second edition. I, I don't see how that would help my games a lot when I want to, wanted to use it. I think what it needs is more supplements. Uh, there were so many elements of the setting that were not covered or not covered well. I specify uh, what specifically in my answer to question seven. Some people will disagree with me because they want to see revised botch and bashing lethal aggravated damage uh, from newer editions, and that would be their argument for a second edition of Sorcerer's Crusade. I don't think it's hard to make those changes on the fly while running a game. I don't think uh, changing those mechanics has much of a cascading effect on, on so many other things. Also, a second edition of Sorcerer's Crusade would bring many changes to the system, setting, approaching, you name it. My advice to mage fans is be careful what you wish for. <laughs> you might get a, a very thick book that changes much more than you were looking to change. So something to keep in mind when you ask for another edition of, of one of your favorite games. I do like the idea, as you mentioned, of rolling it forward and calling it Sorcerer's Crusade. Where are they now? Like when you get an update on child stars and so on like i think we just i find we need a setting that finally discusses steven trevenus though i i really feel as if sorcerer's crusade <laughs> dropped the ball on <laughs> Maybe. That is a joke about the fact that Stephen Trevenus, a.k.a. Robin Hood, was brought up, I think, in five out of every four books. It got mentioned. I think roughly 125% of the Sorcerer's Crusade material made reference to, uh, to, to him as a character. <laughs> Yeah, everybody wanted to claim him as uh, one of their guys, and uh, some some of those claims uh, read a lot better than others. <laughs> yeah, he was like the Rasputin of the uh, the 15th century. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that from the the second edition days of uh, World of Darkness. That was like the running joke that ran a little too far. Every single game line had their their Rasputin in it. That was getting a little nutty back in the what mid 90s. Yeah. Well, number four, does the relative brevity of these two games allow them to be more focused without the semi frequent tonal shifts that made the Ascension experienced over its run? And if so, is that a strength or a detriment? Well, that is a good question. It deserves a good answer, but the best I can manage is it depends. Sorcerer's Crusade and Dark Ages Mage each have one edition and a rule book that isn't so thick. Uh, this makes them approachable for new gamers. It also makes them easier to discuss for fans. What 
I'm discovering more and more is Mage, the Ascension fans create a mashup of the four editions of Mage in their head without meaning to. People tell me they're running Mage 20 and then quote a rule exclusive to second edition, for example. I've been at, at cons and online and just, just again and again, people say, oh yeah, I'm running Mage 20. And then they tell me about the revised edition game, for example. So this isn't going to occur with the historic settings. The drawback is those who take a careful look at the four editions of Mage find options and other points of view. This mage fan has a catalog of pieces and parts to build the chronicle he or she wants. A Sorcerer's Crusade storyteller who wants to wander off the beaten path has to do more homework and has less uh, uh, pieces and parts to choose from. But uh, Terry, how would you address that question? Yeah, um, I was nodding my head furiously, which makes for great audio when you talked about asking someone what edition they play and then just hearing them say one thing and then describe something else. This reminds me of a few years ago when I did the World of Darkness play survey where I'm like, what do you do? And they're like, oh, we use a custom LARP system called Shining Host. I'm like, that's just the name of the Changeling LARP system. <laughs> like, that's just... <laughs> this is an interesting question because it asks kind of what is the effect of each incremental book? And each book has the choice of kind of doubling down on the themes that the previous book introduced or changing. And doubling down can either result in hemming you in, which is boring, or recapitulating and reinforcing it, which can be fascinating. For instance, Adam likes the openness and wildness of first edition, and I agree, that's great. It was There's a lot more space. I don't know if we could literally have gotten 40 books of first edition. Like, at a critical point, you're either going so far afield that you're like, where are we even? Or eventually you wind up having to, to define out some of that open area that we as gamers sometimes crave. Like uh, Revised was very oops all Avatar Storm, but by the end of the line, we had 11 different ways of circumventing the Avatar Storm. So it's like, no, I don't like Revised. The, the Avatar Storm is terrible and you can't deal with it. And I'm like, Re really? <laughs> you can view that as a good thing or a bad thing. Like the first four books of Revised are like, everything is nice and broken and better stay home. And then by the time we get the guide to traditions, it's like, yep, magic is isolated. Here's 40 groups that do interesting things. Also, each tradition has a badass sword. Wouldn't have called that from the <laughs> from the core book. It takes a couple of books unless you have an incredibly firm vision to figure out what the game is. In Sorcerer's Crusade, there was a shift from the first book that wanted a kind of gritty medieval experience and then subsequent books waffled on whether or not you're doing genre emulation or not, like Swashbuckler's Handbook felt very um, historical period drama adventure emulation to me, and others were more historical accuracy, and others are, here's an invisible dra island full of dragon with a stick in the center that holds reality together, have fun with that. No edition of Mage has had really consistent editing and authorship, so it tends to go this way and that. Across the few books, it's been a process of finding and, and taking things away, so I don't think it was necessarily served by it because I don't think there was a consistent enough core to those first few books to explain it. In Dark Ages, there were two books, and I would argue that's not actually enough to run Dark Ages Made. So Adam and I looked at some other Dark Ages material to fill in a bunch of the blanks, and by the time you do that, even then, the themes have shifted so I think it's one of those things where it is hard to remove the way we as readers fill in the blanks when an answer is not given. So I don't think it was necessarily more focused, and I'm, I'm largely okay with that. So Adam, do you think these two games feel like they stand on their own, or do they never escape the contemporary mage's shadow? Like... Vampire Dark Ages was popular enough that it could have had its own fan base distinct from Vampire the Masquerade, and I know people who are just Vampire Dark Ages fan. Werewolf the Wild West and Wraith the Great War were never really big enough to just have their own thing. Uh, do you think that Sorcerer's Crusade and Dark Ages Mage escape the, the, the shadow of Mage Modern? Dark Ages Mage from All I See does not stand on its own. It assumes knowledge from the modern era game. There's not a lot propping it up. Even the writers of uh, Mage Material and Dark Ages books seem to make that assumption. So I like the game, but I cannot construct an argument in my mind that Dark Ages Mage stands on its own or has its own fan base. When I talk to uh, Mage fans online, some of them talk about how they like it or how they dabble with it, but I, I've never met a person who says, oh, I'm 
you know, my group were Dark Ages Mage and nothing else. I, I just haven't met those people. Sorcerer's Crusade is in a good position to stand on its own. Uh, it's written for it. It's well supported. Okay, minor gripe here. It mentions uh, Kurdaman, but doesn't give rules for it. Okay, that doesn't exactly help it to stand on its own. But still, pushing that aside, game does stand on its own well. But I haven't met people who say, you know, my group just plays Sorcerer's Crusade, or, or I'm a Sorcerer's Crusade fan, and then I learned about Mage the Ascension. It's No, the people that I meet are, they were Mage the Ascension fans first, and they really... You know, some of them really like Sorcerer's Crusade and, and really take it seriously. So uh, I think Sorcerer's Crusade can stand on its own. I think it, it pretty much deserves to stand on its own. But in my own experience, the Sorcerer's Crusade fans were mage fans first, and they claim to be fans of both. But uh, yeah, that, that's the best answer I can really give for that. But Terry, what have you seen? It, it comes down in two different directions for me. Like Sorcerer's Crusade is very much informed by modern mage and you can see the through line of how you get from one to the other. So narratively, no, to me, Sorcerer's Crusade is very clearly attempting to be like the precursor. So in that regard to lore and so on, I think a lot of things only make sense if you know what's going to happen. Dark Ages Mage doesn't have that. I see people who like Dark Ages Mage or Sorcerer's Crusade and are not interested in contemporary mage for whatever reason. They're like, I don't want to play an urban fantasy game about wizards in the modern era or something like that. But I don't know that those people get around to actually playing mage. It's more of a, if I had to play mage, I would want to play this historical setting. Systems and mechanics wise, Sorcerer's Crusade is too close to 2E for me, but it has a bunch of tiny little departures from it that just make it like impossible to keep track of in my head. Like I would need to have like the list of uh, 10 things one must remember when running Sorcerer's Crusade of attempting to do so by the book. So like in their own ways, I don't think that Sorcerer's Crusade escapes modern. It could be run on its own, but it is clearly informed by it. And, and a lot of it, like especially things with like the future fates and so on, kind of suggest that that's, that's where it's going. So, and our next question is, do these games feel mechanically complete when compared to Mage 20? Are there obvious gaps, things you feel are missing, or things you're glad that Source Crusade did not add that Mage 20 did? There aren't systems I can immediately think of that M20 has that are interesting that this one doesn't, and that's partially a commentary on, like, M20, <laughs> like not really giving us a full Chantry building system. I think the closest would be some sort of status symbol and some of the stuff we got in Technocracy Reloaded, like on how to build missions and so on. Reality zones aren't really there systematically. Like we kind of get a shitty version of linear magic at one point with, uh, which is in Pagans, but that's about it. Dark Ages Mage, I'm not sure. If you include like Dark Ages Vampire, we get like kind of a Chantry system. The pillars seem weird, except and you can kind of get where you want them to. The biggest one to me is the fact that we never really get any information on the Umbra. It's it's super vague, it's super open, which may be useful, but one of the things I like about historical settings is the ability to do then and now. And to do that, you you kind of need to have both. And we just never really got a lot of that, that Umbra-y stuff. What did you think about the mechanical completeness of the editions? I think this is a really subjective question. I mean, I'm glad it was asked, but Mage 20 follows a trend in RPG design where the rules anticipate a large number of things that could happen during play. More of a complete rule set uh, appeals to some people. Other people find it overwhelming. Uh, Sorcerer's Crusade and Dark Ages Mage give us less rules and options than, than Mage 20. And to be honest, even with my love of lighter rule sets, I, I think they are incomplete. For handling umbral travel and scenes, I would get what I need from modern day mage. For uh, gifted acolytes and infernal hedge wizards, uh, Dark Ages needs to borrow from Sorcerer's Crusade. Uh, there are a number of detailed uh, skill rules and structural damage rules that I'm kind of glad uh, aren't in the historical games because they're more than, than what I need for running my games. But uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much my take on it. Uh, Terry, well, how did you approach that? You're telling me that you don't want incredibly detailed cannon systems? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> cannons versus balloons we needed in there. But yeah, uh, structure and durability. So what book do you feel was missing from these games? What topic, theme, or area do you feel deserves to be fleshed out? Uh, for Sorcerer's Crusade, we need more tradition chantries to tell us what the order of reason and the traditions are doing to maneuver against each other. Uh, how about bygones and umbrud that are... Uh, ha hatching schemes on Earth, uh, more mage factions that didn't survive to the modern era, uh, the magic styles books that cover faith, pagan, mystic, etc., 
and uh, let these books give us details on the mage factions who follow these styles. How is faith magic uh, giving the Gabrielites an edge in Italy? Uh, how is pagan magic helping the Verbena forge alliances in Ireland? For Dark Ages Mage, a central conflict would help so much. Uh, this is the only mage game that has no central conflict or crisis. Uh, the main problem of the era adds drama. It suggests stories. It brings the other elements of the setting into focus. A new Dark Ages book uh, could give us that. Uh, let's get away from one mage team versus another. What if a group of Umbrood are arming hedge wizards with new path magic and sending them to attack mages? Uh, this makes the revised edition look like a long-desired reconciliation. Or changes in ley lines are altering nodes and causing conflicts with uh, were creatures and fey. Uh, now look at each fellowship and region in Europe to see how the central conflict is different there. The setting would come to life for me, and I would just love that. But so those are my thoughts on on what's missing. But uh, Terry, I'd like to hear what you think. Can you stop proposing supplements that I want to buy? Like, just give me <laughs> I don't know something outlining the status of the traditions. I, for instance, liked that we got information on Horizon and Duizatep. I did not like that. That's really all we got information on. Like, if we just don't know enough about what the meeting places of the traditions kind of look like, as Adam mentioned, more information on the on the Umbro would have been interesting. I. I would have liked any information on the crafts just because I feel like entering the age of sale, this is when the crafts would really be front and centered. Like as the order of reason is exploring the world, who are they coming in contact with and what is their magic and what are their thoughts and responses that and the Imperial era are going to probably be the two times where I feel like the crafts are really forward for dark ages. I just want more information about like, places and events like we got seemingly four statted dark ages mage mages across all of the material and the supplementary material and in darkening skies which was a book that didn't come out until the 21st century all of those characters are just like beastly in terms of all of them have their foundation at five all of them have pillars out the wazoo i feel to some extent that was just to make it so the authors are like uh, Darn it, Al Haj is a pillar. What does that do compared to Mikael? I don't know. If they're all at five, they can probably do it. Have fun, storyteller. <laughs> that that would probably be the the thing I, I would most want to see. Kind of a who's who and 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 a book of places. I guess more specifically, a book of places that didn't have anything to do with King Arthur. I'm tired about hearing about King. Arthur. Yeah, as you say that, uh, you make me think. I, I, I did not have it in mind while reading the books, but yeah, it does make a lot of sense in Sorcerer's Crusade to look at the different you know, disparates or crafts uh, that were encountered because I do see a lot of mention in mage books when talking about history of, hey, the uh, Order of Reason, t Technocracy, whatever, they swept in, they, uh, they were with a colonizing group that has superior technology and they steamrolled everyone. And I can see a situation where in Sorcerer's Crusade, these ships are going out all over the world. They have a small number of Order of Reason mages. They land in a place where they're outnumbered and they don't have the local knowledge. And so I, I can see how reports come back to the Order of Reason in Europe and they would be saying, uh, hey, you know, this island group looks really interesting, but uh, there are mages there. They can do things we can't do. They have uh, knowledge of what's going on there that we don't have. They have uh, magic uh, tricks up their sleeve, and we can't just roll over them. We can't just say, we have guns, we win. And so I can see how the Order of Reason would be wanting to you know, send out delegates and meet with these mages because they would probably be thinking, we can't just steamroll these guys. They, they've got all the local nodes. They, they know all the local ley lines and bygones and, and you know, et cetera. And we, we can't just stomp on them. And so that, that could be a very interesting thing to put into supplements for Sorcerer's Crusade. And, you know, think, thinking back, uh, there was a question a few back about how Sorcerer's Crusade could use a second edition. Terry and I both thought that uh, maybe it doesn't really need a second edition. But when it comes to Dark Ages Mage, I think it needs a second edition. Um, I, I think it needs a second edition to get the uh, counter magic and the pillar magic system. Just give it, a, I, need, I think it really needs a second pass because every, what is it, fellowship of mages is using different pillars and uh, some of them uh, seem very strong while others seem very weak. Some of them seem terribly vague to me when I read through. It just needs a second pass. I think a, a second edition for Dark Ages Mage 
I, I would pay money for that and I would use that instead of the first edition. And, and as Adam mentions, the Order of Reason Encountering the World, that's something that you can play on either side. You can be the craft, you can be the order, you, it can be a secret thing in the pocket of the storyteller who's like, oh, I don't think my players are ready for this. And like kind of at the same time, if you're setting a game during the lead up to the convocation, there has to be the part where mages are answering the call or alternatively, like there's that moment where the euthanatoi come together, where the Greek euthanatoi and the subcontinent Chakravanti are like, well, I guess we are kind of doing the same thing. And I think enough information to run those kind of diplomatic missions, regardless of how they turn out, would be interesting. Like, we never really get enough about the move to Shakal Noor to run with, or the Dalala Shi, or anything like that. And those, those kind of scream for an explanation, even if there isn't a huge amount of necessary system behind it. What do these historical games give to the modern setting, and what do you feel can be mined from them? I'm not aware of what Dark Ages Mage contributed to the modern setting. At least I can't think of it right now. Uh, Sorcerer's Crusade gave several mage factions, as well as the legacy of the Kasi Rafai that was mentioned repeatedly in Revised Edition. Uh, Sorcerer's Crusade also began the new approach to teaching magic rules used in Mage 20. It had brief sections for the Nine Spheres, followed by, on page 255, uh, the how do you do that section that gives a list of effects and the rules for them. When I think of new things to pull out of these games, my first thought is the bonus in Dark Ages for working within the local system of beliefs or superstitions. Uh, when a modern mage is alone with one or a few people, using their beliefs or desires should give uh, some kind of bonus. Making the mage's style of magic conform to the sleeper's beliefs brings an interesting challenge. Storytellers shouldn't let it be easy. Uh, let it be role-played out, not necessarily just rule systems uh, for conforming to the sleeper's beliefs. Uh, I already mentioned pulling backgrounds from Dark Ages, uh, taking the paradox rules from Sorcerer's Crusade, and maybe even pushing them farther to handle magic in the Umbra or when a marauder is around uh, could be a lot of fun. Or use them for chaos magic or unstable tasks. Uh, you got quintessence from a hollow one node? Well, you're in for a wild ride, buddy. I already mentioned using bygone bestiary for gifted acolyte. As for setting material, revised edition uh, enjoyed pulling in several Order of Reason wonders. I would take the Order of Reason's Portus Crucis Skyrigger dock and say that it was the start of a breakthrough discovery that the technocracy is nervous about the traditions discovering. The discovery isn't the Skyriggers, but the space they traveled through and how it relates to physical space. That's what makes the void ships that attack nodes so fearsome. Uh, I think that could be something to really run with. But uh, Terry, what uh, what did you what did these two historical games give to the modern setting, uh, in, in your opinion, and what uh, would you mine from them? I think the biggest thing it gives me is it raises an interesting philosophical question because Dark Ages Mage uses different magic, so a modern mage looks back and go, "How did they do this?" And is it literally a thing where the metaphysical fundament of the universe has changed? And this could be a question for a technocracy game who, where a character is doing research and they start opposing the, the party line. Maybe there is a modern attempt to reinvigorate the pillars and may just gain the ability to be quite potent in narrow areas. The other thing is we get a up close and personal look about certain events in mage history in the same way that the fragile path really zooms in on an event that we know is kind of important, but we make it personal. In the entry we got for Doizatep, we get the information on like the scheming that occurred when it got pushed to the Shade Realm of Forces and the Penumbra of Mars. So it, it gives a lot of flavor and mouthfeel to a lot of those eras. And the other thing to me it gives us is a feeling that what happened was both more and less preordained than what we thought it was. Like we see the fact that already the craft masons are like, well, this is a failure. We already see that the Caserify feel torn in what they are doing. So it reminds us of like how much can change over time. So we have like revised meta plot in vampire where the gangrel become an independent clan and then you see modern 
discussions about mage and being like, oh, what if blah blah left? What if the dream speakers just said, we're tired of this shit and we're going our own way. We're tired of this stuff and we're going our own way. Like a bunch of big changes have happened in mage history. Doing a big shakeup in your game like that is par for the course. Like you look at these settings and you see how much has shifted over time and factions have joined and left and key figures. And it gives you that depth, that second dimension, that contrast, that show of movement that really lets you be, I think, more confident as a storyteller shaking up the world and going, no, history is weird and messy sometimes, and that is entirely fine. And that to me is kind of the the big thing it gives me. And it also gives us the enchantment rules from Dark Ages Mage, which on the whole I think are better than the Prime Sphere. So that that's probably the big thing. <laughs> like, holy dink, all it took was 115 bucks for someone to be like, Quintessence, we should make it so it's actually useful. Jim, I like the cut of your jib. Shove it in edition that no one's ever going to read that's only ever going to go two books. Okay, boss, on it. <laughs> and that is the story of Quintessence. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts on the uh, on the two editions or our kind of romp through mage history? You know, the only thing that comes to mind is, again and again, I, I talk to uh, role-playing fans, and uh, you mention a, a historical setting, and they're like, oh, I, I'm not an expert on history, or I don't want to read a big stack of books on real-world history to get ready for this. And I just want to emphasize again, it's not about getting your historical facts straight. It's about running a game in a time and a place when, when life, life was different. That things things were different, and your know, day to day experience was different. The clothes people wore were different. What you can expect out of the uh, factions and ideas in places you know in the world of darkness can be quite different. And so, let it be refreshing. Don't let it be a chore. And as long as you have that mindset when you approach historical settings, um, I think you're going to find it's a lot of fun instead of a lot of work. But uh, no, th- those are really my closing thoughts. But ha- how about uh, yours, Terry? It gives a sense of totality for me that there isn't some weird corner of mage that I'm just unfamiliar with. Like, so for years I heard people saying, well, if M20 really wanted to double down on Paradigm, it would reintroduce Pillars. And having read the Pillars, I'm like, nope. We're good. <laughs> don't 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 need that. We're <laughs> even seeing like the pillars when first presented. So like yes, maybe theoretically that is the thing. It just kind of reminds me of like arguments between programmers where it's like, oh, if you were a real programmer, you would do this, this, and this. And then you're like, yes, I understand the weird theoretical argument you're making on a particular ground, but when it actually has to be played. No one is going to be able to do that. No one is going to be able to use your keyboard that just consists of a big one and a big zero that allows you to uh, to type in pure binary and merge with the machine or whatever. So, so that was nice. And kind of the other part about it is it did give a chance for a bunch of different authors to participate and see what their version of Mage was. So like, I really enjoyed Order of Reason as a book. And that was Brian Campbell just being like, go, do your do your thing, technocracy boy. And he's like, okay, I'm going to technocrat. And he technocrated. And a lot of people are like, uh, he technocrated the, the dink out of that. And you're like, yeah, is it good? I don't know, but it's neat. That I certainly appreciated. Like the fact that we got a Ken Height to be able to write on it and Stephen Michael DePesa to do to do a bunch of stuff. And the art of Quentin Hoover was good. So I will always appreciate uh, more of that material. And if we had gotten another five books for 2E and another five books for Revised, I'm not sure what they would have been. So I, I'm perfectly fine with the with the word count having gone this direction. I would have loved to have gotten the setting book that we were supposed to have gotten on the Holy Lands. Otherwise, I'll, I'll take it. Adam brought this up as an idea that's like, let's read Sorcerer's Crusade. And I'm just like, okay, sure. And I, I don't regret it at all. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really wanted to jump in because I, I not only did I have the books, but uh, I played in a Sorcerer's Crusade game a while back, and, and I was like this uh, loud loud and, and crazy uh, hermetic, and there was this other guy playing a hermetic, and I was going over to him saying, hey, let's do this, because we're supposed to do this, and he's like, uh, uh, okay, and I was kind of like leaning <laughs> by the hand for a while, and, and, and then after like a few games, he came back, he's like, no, no, this is cool, I'm really into this now, and then he was leading me by the hand, and it was just such a fun experience, it's like, I, I gotta talk about this. Hermeticism, people. it's infectious. <laughs> <laughs> An entire paradigm based on, but what if I don't want to? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. Subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other aggregators. If you like the show, others might like it too and if you leave a review of mage the podcast it makes us more visible in their searches you can follow us on twitter 
at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there and see the complete show notes we prepare for you. We have a YouTube channel now where you can find our episodes. There's a link in the show notes, but you can just search for Mage the Podcast and you're going to find us. Uh, we're also on Mastodon. Uh, there's a link in the show notes. That one is a little hard for me to memorize. Uh, this episode was assisted greatly by our executive producers. Uh, Terry, can you share the names of them? I would be glad to. My allergy medication just hit, so it feels like my mouth is just stuffed with cotton balls. I'm going to call it a paradox backlash. I would like to thank Oracle Sean Gallagher, Oracle Benjamin Bendelow, Oracle Buck Gregory, Oracle Christopher Phillips, Oracle Guy Conan Stewart, Oracle Joshua Hillrup, Oracle Pukuji, Oracle Neil Patterson, Oracle Jay Widener, Oracle McCare, and Oracle the Crew of Erebus, as well as Archmaster Ender at his seating, Archmaster Brad the Blue, Archmaster Dan Svensson, Archmaster Derek Sven- Semsek, Archmaster Jason Vines, Archmaster Morgan Aran, Archmaster Nathan Weaver, Archmaster Patrick McNamara, also Alex, Alexia, Anders S, Anon, Baderfi, Birdo, Blaze Hebert, Blake Ryan, Brandon, Bryce Perry, Chris B, Sin Shadis, Daniel Cuppin, Daniel Scribner, David Roy, Dennis Osborne, Eli Levenger, Eric Schwenk, Fraggerock, George Laura, Henry Kraft, Eobel, Jason Kennedy, Jason W. Briggs, Jay Gatsby, J- uh, Jeff Bren, Jenna F., John Magnuson, Jolyn Andes, Lawson Stuff, Joshua Heath, Kathleen Halperin, Chris Kinner, Leroy Bruce, Leslie Weatherstone, Matthew Poyle, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Nathan Weaver, Nabarro, Nikita Klamanov, Oliver Schindler, Patrick Mulder, Rachel Grace, Ricardo, Richard Baprooster, Robarth the Robot, Ryan Stray, Rob H., Ryan Kennedy, Samuel Tobin, Schnabelta Krieger, Starfish, Stefan Carton, Thrice Great, Vincent Hamilton, William Connolly, William Martin, and Zach Rules. Well, if you would like to become an executive producer for Mage the Podcast, it would help us keep producing episodes like this one. You would also become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link in the show notes will get you started. Well, thanks everyone for listening, and until next time, truth until paradox, baby. Go change reality in this time or the one of your choosing. Bye.